Here is my story from five years ago when I lost my dear husband. My name is Sarah Fisher. I married Joel a little over 15 years ago. We have two children, 13-year-old Mary and 8-year-old Emmanuel. Joel and I met in college. I work as a civil engineer, and he is an accountant with a Ph.D. in mathematics. If someone has problems with the books, he solves them. Today I'm visiting Belvoir State Park and hoping to learn something about Joel. This is my fifth trip here since he disappeared. First I talk to the rangers to see if there is any new information from my last visit. Every little thing will be important to me. Then I go to the waterfall where he disappeared to grieve and pray for him. I miss him so much. I know that deep down he is alive because we are soul mates. Every time one of us suffers, the other feels it. I feel that he is alive and well. When I return to this wall where I am now sitting, I feel his presence. He's somewhere nearby. I'm sure he misses me as much as I miss him. I felt his presence especially strongly last year on my fourth anniversary, remembering the day he disappeared. Joel has always been a big man. What am I talking about? Doctors called him morbidly obese. He was 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighed just under 400 pounds. He also had severe diabetes. He didn't exercise as much as he should have because he worked in an office and ate constantly. During that visit the weather was terrible, heavy rain and strong winds. On the 3rd of July, Wednesday, the day began clear, sunny and cloudless. A light breeze was blowing. The water downstream was moving fast and high. We came here every first week of July to celebrate the place where he proposed to me. We sat on this very wall in the far right corner. If you've been here, you know that this is where the wall begins to descend and disappears into the forest. It's a short walk of about half a mile from the parking lot. In the last few years that we were together, Joel had to stop several times to rest as we walked here from the car. His weight increased by about 20 pounds every year. That night he wore a bright red sweater. In the morning we went to the metal railing to take a photo of the waterfall from the top. There was a loud scream from a woman, and I saw a red flash fall from the waterfall. If there were other people there, I didn't notice them. He was wearing a bright red sweater that morning. There is a place at the bottom of the waterfall where the water can spin a person for a long time before letting go. This is called the deadly whirlpool. Water in a stream more than six feet deep continues to flow further. They found his fanny pack by the stream, with his wallet, camera, and important medical supplies that he always carried with him. They also found torn pieces of his shirt washed ashore on both sides of the stream at a distance of two, three miles. The owner of the hotel where we always stayed was there that day. He was very kind and tried to console me. Last year I met a man who looked like a forester sitting in the far corner and seemed lost. He had a huge, muscular body, long, unkempt hair and beard. Next to him at a distance sat a woman in the same clothes. I wanted to talk to them, but his appearance scared me. I plucked up the courage to approach them, but when I turned around, they were no longer there. If they come back, I will definitely talk to them this time. Caroline is the last surviving member of a family that has lived in these mountains for almost 300 years. She is about 35 years old. Caroline is a beautiful woman. Her hair is starting to turn gray after being blonde her entire life. Life was hard for her after her mom and dad died within months of each other. This happened about six years before the beginning of our story. She is strong and moves quickly and quietly when needed. This beautiful woman can lift 400 pounds of stones or wood and carry it on her shoulder for over a mile. She can plow a three-acre garden in the spring, using a single-blade plow and a mule in less than a morning. Few people know about her. There is a neighbor down the road who takes Carolina produce and eggs into town for the farmer's market every Saturday. There is a postwoman who delivers mail every Tuesday and there is a land office employee who accepts property tax payments every spring. She rarely goes into town. When this happens, she is almost invisible to the townspeople. She lives in the same house that the first generation of her family built from stones and logs from the nearby forest. Mom and Dad had five children who survived the first three years. 
All were named after nearby cities and other states or countries that the family knew of. Caroline was their last child, which many might call unexpected. Her family called her a gift from heaven. She was desired and loved. She was the only girl who survived. She was sickly as a child, but began to grow around the age of five. After that there was no stopping her. At fifteen she was as strong as her brothers. They were all eight years or more older than her. Her four brothers died early, leaving her to care for their parents. That year she didn't have time to get to her mailbox on Tuesday and Wednesday. There was no mail on Thursday. It was the 4th of July, five years ago, and Caroline was walking up the path along the stream. She moved quickly and didn't make a sound. She startled several rabbits and raccoons who scattered and disappeared long before she arrived. If she was hunting, she would already have them in her basket. As she continued on her way, she heard sounds she had never heard before, something like a scraping and groaning noise. They started and stopped, repeating again and again. She stepped off the path towards the water and looked down. At the bottom of the slope, there was a huge human silhouette. At first, she saw neither face nor head. Then I saw bubbles rising from underneath it. Soon the head slowly rose out of the water, making soft coughing and wheezing sounds, and the head fell back into the water. She didn't get up again. The water was higher than usual, but the wall of the bathing area made of stones would keep her there if she fell into the water. She jumped into the water and turned him over so his head was on his side, the water draining slowly. She saw no signs of breathing. She remembered a story her dad told her when she was a girl. The boy fell into the pond and drowned. The father, full of grief, ran with the child on his shoulder to the doctor in town. By the time he ran two miles to the doctor's office, the boy was already laughing from the crazy ride. This might work, she thought. She lifted him to the shore, jumped out of the water, and ran towards her house, holding him face down. As she laid him on the porch, she felt his faint breathing. She turned it on its side, and some more water flowed out. Soon the flow increased, and the man coughed up a large amount of water. It was warm during the day, and the sun was shining on him, so she lefty saw him there and watched him carefully. Soon the water stopped flowing. His breathing began to return to a normal rhythm, and he fell into a deep sleep. Caroline had no formal education, but somewhere deep inside she knew that if he showed signs of life, she should wait to take further action. Besides, she didn't know what else to do. When she woke up, she baked bread and made ham and cheese sandwiches. Soon she returned and saw that the sun was no longer shining on him. Instead, her three dogs curled up around the man, keeping him warm. It is often cold in the mountains at night, so when she went to get a jacket, she brought a blanket for the man. I hung the lantern on the rafters so that the light would fall on it. About four in the morning he groaned, the dog stood up and moved away from him. The blanket slid off them, and she saw him wet his pants. He went back to sleep. The next morning, she woke up much later than usual and hurried to catch up with her business, watching her charge. The sun rose higher, and he began to come to his senses. After it became clear that he could not sit up due to dizziness, he turned his head to the side. He saw trees, underbrush, and what was thought to be a yard on the mountain. She soon noticed his eyes were open and left work to take care of him. Early in the morning she brought her mother's nurse's notes and searched until she found the necessary prescriptions. He had a so-called death rattle in his chest. She knew he had pneumonia and if not treated quickly it could kill him. She began preparing tea according to one recipe and a poultice according to another. He took only a few sips of tea but did not drink more. She applied the poultice as she had been taught. He didn't like it even more than the tea. Soon he got tired and fell asleep. When I woke up a few hours later, I noticed that the wheezing had almost gone away. Caroline gave him warm broth, slightly sweetened with tea. In the evening he slept in the bed next to her, since there was no other suitable large bed. He didn't remember any of his names, so she suggested William. With the help of gestures, he showed her that he did not remember anything, not even his name. She knew he could hear because he flinched several times when the dogs came up behind him. After she told him that they were dogs and their names, he tried to speak, 
but could only make moans and squeaks. She hummed a note, and soon he was able to hum too. It took months before he began to use simple words correctly. He wanted to help with the housework, but was too weak to do much. He tried to do everything she did. Sometimes he would get it right and spend the whole day doing it. He never forgot a task if he performed it correctly. After six months, he could fold laundry, wash dishes, fetch firewood, and perform many other tasks. He also lost almost 60 pounds. He could speak in short sentences and ask simple questions. On the 3rd of July, at the end of his first year, he spoke clearly and read short children's stories. He also lost up to 280 pounds, most of which was muscle. He moved as quickly and silently as Caroline. Mathematics returned to him on its own. At first it was simple calculations, then his abilities opened at such a speed that Caroline could not understand. He began to teach her everything he knew about mathematics. She learned as quickly as he remembered the processes. However, he had no memory of his past. After a year and a half, he weighed 190 pounds and was mostly muscular. A few months later, Caroline had a dream about dogs. Waking up in the middle of the night, she realized that she was pestering him. He was conscious with a puzzled expression on his face. What was it? he asked. She was embarrassed and ran out of the house onto the porch. He came out a few minutes later, confused, not understanding why she was acting this way. Shyly, he said quietly, did we do something wrong? And again, why did it feel so good? What was she supposed to say? How can I explain to this man-boy how men and women differ? How to explain the creation of new life? I'm tired, she said. I'll explain in the morning. Go back to bed. I'll be there soon. He lay there, waiting to make sure she was okay. She had never put off answering his questions before and always answered quickly. He soon came out and found her sleeping in an old rocking chair. He didn't try to move her for fear of waking her. He just brought some blankets and wrapped her up to keep her warm. He hung a lantern to illuminate her face. He brought a few more blankets and lay down on the floor of the porch. She woke up long before he did and saw them both sleeping on the porch, surrounded by all the dogs. She was surprised at how carefully he wrapped her up to keep her warm. As she lay there, she saw a pair of pigs mating in a pen. Now she knew how to explain. She was in her thirties and had no man, about to explain an act she had never participated in to this big gentle man. She imagined the questions he might ask. Oh, how can I explain? Be as honest as you can, she heard a small voice in her head. After breakfast, she sat William down to explain. Both decided that the conversation was over and went about their daily business. When they went to bed that evening, the room was filled with awkwardness. Lying with their faces turned away from each other, they could not fall asleep for a long time. Finally, William said softly, I'm really sorry. Caroline waited a moment and replied, I know, maybe it's best not to talk about it for a while. She heard a quiet answer, Okay, I didn't want to embarrass you. Soon they were fast asleep. The next morning we woke up, turned to each other, and simply smiled, starting a new day. At the end of the third year, at the beginning of June, he told her about the feeling he had. You said you found me at the creek bath on the 4th of July. I have a feeling that someone is looking for me at this time every year, someone from my past. They are sad and lonely. I think this year I need to follow the stream and look for a place where I could have fallen. I hope I find something about my past. Can I do it this year? If I find something, I'll come back and tell you. I don't know anything about the lands beyond the bathhouse. Mom and Dad said there were bad people there. We need to think and make a plan before we do something like that. Both found no reason not to go explore. So they set out on the 2nd of July, making sure the animals had enough food and water. They also took enough food for three days, bedding and waterproof raincoats for the night. They traveled along the stream for a considerable distance before a trial appeared. He soon noticed that the trail was marked with orange squares on rocks and trees. She remembered that in the old days, travelers cut the bark from trees to mark the path they had traveled. These were called markers. Dad told them about this in one of his stories. 
Soon they heard the roar of a waterfall ahead. They came to the bottom and stood in amazement. After a while, when nothing changed, it began to get boring, and they decided to go down the path while the sound of the waterfall was barely audible. They then turned left and walked a short distance into the forest to set up camp for the night. The next morning, as they cleared out camp, William I began to feel the same as every third of July. At first it was a slight feeling, as always. Over the next hours it became more and more intense. Caroline sat next to him, and they talked quietly for a long time. When they returned to the picnic area after lunch, the feeling was very strong. Caroline moved away from him so he could concentrate. The man was confused and sad, he felt it. Who is this man, he thought. Over the next hour, most of the people left and were replaced by new ones, except for the woman sitting on the wall. Caroline walked around the stranger and soon found herself behind her. The woman sat and watched the people coming and going, their faces as they came to see the falls. It took two times for the woman to realize that the voice was addressed to her. Caroline spoke for the third time. Today really was a beautiful day. Yes, it is, Sarah answered. Do you come here often? Their accents and sentence structure were different, but they began to understand each other as they continued to talk. Are you with that man on the other wall? asked Sarah. Caroline replied, Let's just say William is family. It was the only way she felt she could answer honestly. Sarah knew all of Joel's relatives. She was disappointed with this answer. When she looked at him, he felt her feelings and was sad for her. After a short conversation, Caroline returned to him. William stated that this was the woman who made him feel. She is very upset now. She was hoping for different answers. Can we find a way to get to know her better? Sarah was on the verge of tears as she slowly stood up to leave the place. Caroline quickly stood up and followed her to the path. We're sorry to see you upset, she said, touching her arm to get her attention. Sarah replied, There was an accident here many years ago, and I lost a loved one. Her grief was so great that she could not tell the details. The feelings were so strong that she wanted to burst into tears. Caroline thought there was a lot more to this story. She needed more time to figure everything out. She suddenly blurted out, We'd like you to visit us tomorrow if you can. Sarah felt joy in William's thoughts. She was going to refuse, but then changed her mind. She turned and replied, I think I'd like that. You will find Gilead on the map. It is east of here. Coming into town from the north on Highway 34. It ends at Main Street turns right and drives to the end of the pavement, then continues straight along the road. When you see the fence covering the Smith-Jones mine, see a small dirt road to the right, drive until you see the first house and continue about five miles until you see a faded red mailbox on the right. Park at the trailhead between the box and the bridge over the creek. The bridge is old and looks precarious, but it is strong and durable. I'll meet you there. It was a long walk back to the hut. They got back before it got dark. Thank God for the long summer days. They walked quickly, silently. William was sure that the woman left the waterfall in a joyful mood and told Caroline about this. Caroline began to realize that she might soon be left alone if Sarah turned out to be his wife. She thought about this as she moved. Everything had been fine before he came, and she would survive if she were left alone again. She realized how much a companion adds to her life. Sarah returned to her friend's hotel for the night. She was full of hope and happier than ever. She read the mood of that man at the waterfall. He was the one she had felt all these years. What could she say to her friend, she thought. Rick comforted her the day Joel disappeared and seemed more interested in her than a friend. Many times he hinted that he would like to take their relationship to another level, to be more intimate. Sarah was able to keep it from developing while she felt Joel's spirit communicating with her. But she began to wonder what it would be like to be with Rick. She will never betray her love for Joel as long as she feels him nearby. The only thing she couldn't understand was how that person could be the one who fell from the waterfall. The changes were too great to justify this thought. William was worried when they went to bed. He felt the confusion in her thoughts and was worried. Sarah was already asleep by then, 
but woke up with excitement, thinking about the shy stranger and his relationship with Caroline. William and Sarah fell asleep about midnight, worrying and wondering about each other. The morning came early for Villa Three Ma and Caroline. They needed to catch up on things they had missed before their guests arrived. It had been many years since they had visitors to the cabin. Everything had to be perfect. Sarah arrived at the bridge around noon, as agreed. There was no one in sight. She stepped onto the bridge and looked at the fast-flowing water, shuddering at the thought of swimming down from the waterfall. Why, the falls were about fifteen miles away. She turned to the car and was surprised to see Caroline on the bank of the stream. The water is higher than usual today. You should see what the rains are doing. They hugged, then grabbed a few things from the car and began the short walk to the hut. The landscape was lush and filled with wildflowers. One patch of orange dailies seemed endless. The color variations were exquisite, from the darkest, almost brown, to almost white. There were striped and variegated flowers. Sarah stopped in amazement. It had been light for several hours already, but as the sun began to appear over the mountain in the east, the temperature began to rise rapidly. When they reached the hut, Sarah was sweating profusely. After sitting on the porch with a glass of spring water, it began to cool down. At that moment, she saw many flowers that amazed her. A barely audible call was heard from the house, and dinner was served. William prepared soup, sandwich cuts, and an assortment of fruit. Everything was placed on the table so that everyone could get what they wanted. Of course, there was also cold, tasty, sweet mountain spring water. Sarah was asked to tell a story about Joel and their life together. William was very interested in the story. There was not a single interruption. The story was soon over. Sarah had a hard time when she got to the part about how Joel drowned and the body was never found. William commented that he may have read a similar story in a book. He couldn't remember the name or many details. But the story was very familiar. Caroline suggested a swim in the bathhouse since the temperature was approaching 100 degrees. Sarah didn't have a swimsuit and was asked to wear shorts and a t-shirt. On the spot, Caroline simply jumped into the water feet first, followed by William. He took off his shirt and jumped in his pants. Sarah was in the process of untying her boots when she gasped, then whispered, Oh, oh my God! Soon she was doubled over, sobbing hysterically and uncontrollably. Caroline was the first to approach her. William was a few seconds behind. She sobbed, inconsolable, for a long time, then lifted her shirt a few inches to reveal a small tattoo. There was a small heart on her side just above her waist. She has a mole like me, William exclaimed. Caroline has seen him many times since she found him. All she could say was, Oh, oh my God, not knowing anything about tattoos, she was surprised. How is this possible? Sarah almost came to her senses when she whispered, it's Joel. The words were barely audible. Returning to the hut, Caroline told her story about William. She talked about the strange noises she heard when he stopped breathing, the drive back to the cabin, and William's rehabilitation over the years. We're like brother and sister, she explained at the end. It was getting dark as the discussions died down. Everyone was hungry. We added more vegetables to the soup and brought it to a boil. While it was cooking, more bread, meat, and cheese were cut. We added plenty of fresh fruit to make it a complete meal. Caroline was quiet throughout dinner. The others said little. Sometimes there was a short question and an even shorter answer. William prepared the sleeping bags while the women cleaned up after dinner. Gently, Caroline began to explain the relationship between her and William. At some point, she realized what Sarah was most worried about. Sarah, you need to understand one thing about me. I've never been with a man. We really lived like brother and sister. We slept in the same bed every night, only because the others weren't the right size for us. It started from the second night. I had to listen to see if there were any problems. And it continued like that. Sarah replied and hugged her. I can see that every word you said is true. When all the work was done, they gathered at the table again. Sarah, it's too late to let you go. We all sleep on the porch that night, and in the morning we will decide what to do next.
William woke up first the next morning and found himself in the tight embrace of two women. He smiled. All three did things the next morning. They worked as a team cooking breakfast. After cleaning, they sat down to talk. I'm a little stunned by everything that happened. I've felt something for years, he admitted. I don't remember much about my past life, mainly that I always felt loved and hated my job. I know this is not enough to continue. We need time to get to know each other again, he turned to Sarah. I am grateful to you and can never thank you enough for everything you have done for me, he turned to Caroline. I wish we could all be together here as one big family. These are the first and most important things on my mind. About, since I may have died and been brought back to life, I would like to keep the name we have been using for the last five years. I want to be William. I feel so comfortable. Sarah began. I never believed that you were gone. That first day I was afraid. I, I. I was afraid because I didn't feel your presence. Late afternoon the next day I started to feel something again. The feeling was very weak. I never doubted your love again. Having said that, we need to contact others to let them know what happened. Sarah continued. Caroline, I will never be able to express how much I love you for saving his life. I pray that this will not be necessary, but if it is necessary, I will continue to live. To live without the person I love, who survived all this. Caroline spoke last. I knew from the very beginning that you loved someone else. In your sleep you whispered about your endless love. It looks like I will be the last of my kind to remain on this earth. I don't like the thought of dying alone, without comfort when I die, or having no one to continue my life in this wonderful place. We need to find a way to keep you all close as family. We need to go to the city and find someone to break the news. Sarah smiled. We don't have to go into town. I have a phone in the car that we can use to invite them here. They will want to see the places we talk about, and I'm starting to like it here. You mean one of those phone bags Mom and Dad had on the boat? He asked. Sarah looked at me with questioning eyes. Yes, but now they are much smaller. How and when did you remember this? William just shrugged. Caroline didn't understand what they were talking about. At the car, Sarah took out her mobile phone. The others just looked in surprise. She called 911, asked to speak to the highway patrol, gave them directions to the cabin, and asked them to call the park rangers as well. The first to arrive was an ambulance from the city, with a doctor from the local hospital. A little later, three policemen arrived, then two forest rangers. A total of nine people came. The police wanted to arrest Caroline for kidnapping until William came out onto the porch and pointed a hunting rifle at them, ordering them to drop the weapon. It was so dramatic, Sarah later told her family, laughing. Sarah also called his parents to break the news. I don't want you to hear this on the news, she began. I found Joel, she told his mother. She heard screaming on the other end and an angry voice picked up the phone. Who is it and what did you say that scared her so much? Patiently she began again. This is Sarah. Yes, that same Sarah. Sit down. Are you sitting down? Okay, I found Joel. He has that tattoo you hated so much. Yes, that one. You need to see your mom at the doctor's after she fainted, and you all need to get a good night's sleep. Pack the kids. I'll call you in the morning with directions. Fine? Yes, you can bring her too. She put down the phone and smiled. Mom and Dad are still the same. William smiled. More memories were coming back. Meanwhile, in the hut. The questions began. Sarah pulled out a copy of the report to give the police some information about the case, then Caroline began to tell her story. Everything fell into place, explaining the disappearance and finding of Mr. Pa Joel Fisher. The forest ranger followed his reports and everything matched. We sent a search party down the creek to the river. The report mentions disturbed soil at the site of the bathing area. We couldn't find a path leading from there, so we assumed it was local children playing on a hot day. The only broken area led to the road and back. Some questioned whether she could carry it, which weighed nearly 400 pounds. She flushed and asked the guy, How much do you weigh? About 350. 
Caroline picked him up so quickly that she was halfway across the yard before he realized it. She ran to the pigsty and asked if he wanted to visit them. He shook his head to indicate he didn't want to, and she ran back, carelessly tossing him onto the bottom step of the porch. She stood there, not even out of breath. Come for a year and I'll get you in the same shape as him, she nodded at William. Then she laughed. When everything calmed down, the doctor asked if he could examine William. William shrugged and said, of course. He conducted a full examination and took blood tests. William remembered some of the things that doctors before him did. CBC and test for glycated hemoglobin, he asked. He remembered more. The doctor nodded and muttered, and much more. After his mouth was swabbed, he asked, DNA test? The doctor nodded again. The excitement gradually died down and everyone returned to their daily routines, all except one forest ranger. William walked slowly towards David Fisher, the ranger, and Caroline. She motioned for him to continue. William, this is David. David, meet William. Caroline laughed from time to time, as did David. William apologized and walked away. When he reached Sarah, they both spoke at the same time. They are in love with each other. The laughter spread all the way to the couple, who soon returned to the porch. David asked William, You are her closest relative. Can I visit her sometimes? If she wants to see you, I think that will be fine. Everyone smiled, especially Caroline. It got dark and David had to go back. She and a dozen dogs escorted him to the truck. She took his hand as they approached the edge of the yard. They walked like this until they were out of sight and probably all the way to the truck. The next morning, Sarah went to a hotel where she stayed near the park. Rick was furious about her disappearance. He began to scold her. He didn't notice how Caroline and William approached him from behind. Caroline said in a soft but firm voice, Never talk to a lady like that, and you have no right to talk to her. He turned to Caroline to correct her as an arm slung over his shoulder and lifted him into the air. He was quickly turned around to face a huge man standing next to a woman of the same size. Realizing what had happened, he became frightened and his knees gave way. He remained standing only thanks to the hand holding him. The huge man stared into his eyes, trying to remember where he had seen this small man before. William's eyes began to turn red, his face took on an expression that would frighten the devil himself. Caroline had never heard the noise that soon came out of William's mouth. The words could make a drunken sailor blush. William hit the man. The last words he shouted were, You are the son of a bitch who threw me from the waterfall that day. He turned to leave, Caroline stunned by his words and actions. However, she did not forget to make sure that Rick would not go anywhere. Sarah was on the phone with the police, who arrived very quickly and detained him. Swearing that he had just seen the devil in person, Rick confessed and asked to be sent to safety. After his arrest, everyone searched for William for hours and was nowhere to be found. Finally, Sarah returned to her car in tears. There she found him, sleeping like a baby in the back seat. Her sobs woke him up. He sat down with a puzzled look. Gently stroking her hand, he whispered, What happened? He never remembered his actions and lived the rest of his life as a very gentle man, especially loved by children and animals. They never needed to be afraid of him. When the doctor checked him, his blood pressure was barely readable as it was still above the upper limits of the instruments, but was slowly decreasing. Rick was later found guilty by his own admission and sentenced to 10 to 15 years in state prison. Five years later he died, a lonely and broken man. After a few years, the hotel began to look abandoned, taxes had not been paid for some time, and it was put up for auction. The states bought the land for next to nothing, demolished the hotel, and added 346 acres to their holdings. They eventually allowed a major chain to build a hotel on the site. The rent for the five acres they used more than covered the taxes on commercial land. A few days later, a long gray limousine drove slowly down the road and stopped behind Sarah's car. The path was trodden, they followed it. When they approached the hut, the children were joyfully waiting to meet their dad. 
they were disappointed to see only the mother and another woman sitting with a huge man who they thought was the other woman's husband. Lily snatched the leash from Emmanuel's hand and ran like an arrow straight towards the man. She jumped into his lap from about six feet away. Without a doubt, it was her old friend. The little white dog was still sniffing it and barking with joy. Hello, Lily, he responded. The dog was jumping on his lap, bouncing up and down and peppering his face with kisses. Both children stopped, staring. Mary was the first to run, soon followed by Emmanuel. They both stopped a few feet away. Dad, is this really you? And hundreds of other questions, like machine gun fire. His crooked smile was the only thing that remained the same. As soon as he smiled, they rushed forward to surround him. How he managed to fit two children and a small white dancing dog on his lap remained a mystery. It took some time before things calmed down. Soon he answered all questions with the help of women. A procession of cars going up and down the road was spotted in the city. Rumors began to spread. There had been a murder in the mountains. The mafia was hiding there. Bigfoot had been seen and caught. Someone had opened a mine and found silver or gold, depending on the storyteller. Rumors reached the weekly newspaper, and a reporter was sent to get the story. In fact, it was the owner of the newspaper, since there were no other reporters. He returned a few days later with a story. The story was replicated and sent to news channels. The following year, it won a national award for urban journalism. Soon everyone in town was waving and smiling at each of the cars. When William and Sarah decided to accept Caroline's offer to live in the mountains, Mom and Dad found a house for sale and moved to the city. They were warmly received, even if they were Yankees. The doctor ran DNA tests on Mom, Dad, and both kids just to be sure. The decision was that the probability of their relationship was 99.8%. Caroline didn't know how much land she had. She only knew that she could walk for a long time before she had to return. Upon examination of the deeds, it was discovered that she had only 5,000 acres of the original 55,000 stated in the first act. Over the years, the family sold parts of the land when they needed money. Other parts disappeared due to acquisition by prescription. She was going to explore the possibility of overturning the legal decisions that took the land from her. She and her family paid all taxes during this time, so the requirement that those claiming land pay taxes was not met, even if they did pay them. Years later, courts ruled that owners must pay the fair price for the land at the time of acquisition, plus interest. If they refused, the land was returned to Caroline for her disposal. Only one person thought he could win. His belongings were taken away and he was forcibly evicted. Nobody felt sorry for him. Caroline donated the collected funds to charity. Almost everyone benefited from this. The largest piece of land missing was the top of the mountain, which was seized by the state to create the park. Her great-grandfather reluctantly sold the land. I have no chance of keeping it, he wrote above his signature. The state has too much money and power to allow me to fight this. Attached to the back of the deed was a note signed by him stating that the money was to be deposited for him. The land was seized at the height of the Great Depression. He never mentioned money to his family before he died three years later. The initial investment continued to grow. Whoever managed the fund turned $150,000 into more than $175 million. Caroline and I promised not to tell anyone about this for a long time. The money was entirely in her name. We decided to continue living off the land, as her family had done for a long time. We also found out that years ago, when the mine was closed and no one wanted to buy it, her great-grandfather bought it at auction for the princely sum of $1,800. The taxes were a little over $200 a year. Caroline sold me the land for not much more. Sarah and I continued to work on repairing our relationship. We needed to relearn how to live together. While working on this, we also started discussing what kind of house we wanted. The children lived in the city with their grandparents during the week, and we all spent the weekends with Caroline. Six months later, we repeated our vows. Soon after, we asked for plans to be drawn up to create a home similar to Caroline's. Our house was to be made of stone, have a full basement, and use new building techniques to improve energy efficiency. 
we also had to have electricity and running water. We started looking for contractors and found two old men who were willing to do the work. They always dreamed of building the last house the old, old way. They completed the exterior and massive fireplace before turning the rest of the work over to their sons, who now ran their company. When completed, it was a work of art. They used as many materials as possible from our land. Stones were collected around the entrance to the old mine. The entrance was then blown up three times to close it forever. David and Caroline fell madly in love and had their wedding in the fall at their new home before we moved. Caroline liked the place so much that the old people were again pulled out of retirement to build an extension to her house. She decided to use stone and timber to match the old work. It allowed running water and electricity only in the new part. The old part was checked and no repairs were required. Their first son was born in the spring, followed by three more children. The last one was the little girl she had always dreamed of. Sarah and I had another boy and a girl. We finished almost simultaneously. Children ran along the road between two houses. The grandparents lived into their 90s, were grandparents to both families, and were delighted with each child. They have lived with us for the last few years. Our eldest son bought their house and soon brought his new wife there. He always wanted to live close to other people. The loneliness on the mountain was too much for him. Two sons and a daughter of Caroline and David married our children. Soon houses appeared along the old dirt road. Most of them were built from local materials on the outside. At last count, there were 42 grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren between the two families. Every 3rd of July, Sarah and I visit the waterfall and sit on our wall. Caroline's dream of populating her mountains came true. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.